that's a really interesting question, uh, largely because, like other social democrat left-leaning parties in Europe, the Labour Party has been struggling to hold together quite a uh, difficult coalition. Uh, traditional working class, blue collar uh, voters, um, alongside the so-called new left, professional middle class voters and also ethnic minorities, have given the Labour Party a rather unusual and quite disparate uh, electorate. Those groups have very different interests, they have very different um, policy goals. And the referendum, I think, will bring some of that to the surface, where you will have around 70% of current Labour voters saying they want in, have 30% saying they want out. But don't forget, of course, you'll have a much larger number of working class Britons who the Labour Party should arguably be winning over if it is to uh, return to power in 2020, also holding instinctively Eurosceptic uh, views. So I, I would see the Labour Party um, as coming out of this referendum you know, really in a slightly more uh, um, delicate position than, than it's in going into the referendum. I think UKIP have been more successful at attracting support in Labour areas than people originally thought. Uh, after David Cameron's Bloomberg speech in early 2013, the assumption across most of Westminster was that UKIP essentially was a second home for disillusioned Conservatives. Uh, since then, um, academic analysis uh, has shown pretty convincingly that actually UKIP is a far more complex phenomenon that has also attracted support uh, both in Labour areas as well as from voters who used to vote for the Labour Party before switching to the Conservatives in 2010 and then um, moving over to uh, the, uh, UKIP. Also I think more importantly and something that's often overlooked between 2010 and 2015, and I would argue until today, uh, UKIP is an important reason why the Labour Party has struggled to come back. Um, in areas where support for UKIP has been high, the Labour Party's growth has been less notable than in areas where UKIP has been weak. Uh, and it's quite clear that um, Nigel Farage and his party have complicated what would otherwise have been a smoother uh, path for the main opposition party um, and I think that's that's an important point. The Conservative Party I think faces a more immediate challenge given that there are some fairly open divisions within the Conservative Parliamentary Party as well as the Conservative Party membership. The membership is splitting around 60-40 behind Brexit and of course within the parliamentary party you've got some high profile divisions um, you know, that, that, that extend right up to the cabinet. I think actually the Conservative Party is voicing such disquiet over how the referendum has been handled. For example, David Cameron's uh, uh, you know, promise earlier in the year that he was sitting on the fence and he could go either way. I think that's since been revealed to be a rather empty uh, statement. And I think there's a lot of uh, dissatisfaction within the Conservative Party about that. I think the geography of this referendum is really interesting. We are, uh, as a country, not only divided by class and by generation, but also by where we live. Um, there is a very distinctive map of Euroscepticism in Britain. It sort of runs down the East Coast, um, in the Midlands, Yorkshire, um, some outer areas that surround London. Um, areas that tend to be more economically disadvantaged, where average levels of education tend to be lower. Uh, the Remain camp, on the other hand, has some pretty uh, uh, clear strongholds of its own. Um, big cities, young, urban, diverse areas, which perhaps is why the Remain camp has been focused so heavily on places like Manchester, Nottingham, Oxford, Cambridge, Brighton, Bristol. Uh, these kinds of areas that are quite dense, um, uh, and, and also that have large numbers of um, uh, pro-EU uh, younger voters.